Hi guys, it's me, Professor D, and welcome back to my YouTube channel. On this video, I'm going to continue my series on preeclampsia. This video is part four, and I believe this is going to be five-part series. So on this uh, part, part four, I'm going to be going over into part and care for that patient with preeclampsia. And on part five, which should be the last video of the segment, I'm going to go over the medication pharmacology for preeclampsia, the medications we're going to give, indications, um, adverse reactions, nursing actions, all that good stuff. But for this video, for preeclampsia, we're going to go over the interpartum care. Now, before we get started, as always, I'm going to ask you to please support me and support my channel by liking this video, subscribing to my channel if you haven't done so already. And don't forget, I have audio lessons available on my website, nexusnursinginstitute.com. Now, if you are new to my channel, this is the first video you're watching in the series. I highly encourage you to go back and watch part one, two, and three, because this part four, <coughs> excuse me, will make so much more sense. Okay, so let's get started. Intrapartum care. So. Um, continuous fetal, fetal heart rate and uterine contraction monitoring are going to be initiated and the woman's going to be assessed for signs of placental abruption. And they're giving you those signs and symptoms of placental abruption that you absolutely must know. What are they? Tense, tender uterus. The patient has preeclampsia and now, um, excuse me, they have preeclampsia and now that you see that patient has um, ten tender uterus, you better be concerned about uh, placental abruption. This is a medical emergency. You are going to notify the healthcare provider immediately. The woman's place, uh, excuse me, the woman with preeclampsia with the severe features, they're maintained on bed rest with the side rails up in a quiet, darkened environment. Why? We're going to treat them like we would that patient that has seizures. We want to decrease stimulation, right? Emergency drugs, oxygen, and suction equipment should be checked and readily available because this patient can go into seizures at any moment. Take a look at this um, box, coping with activity restrictions. These are the teachings you're going to do for the patient. Remember, if the patient... Um, has preeclampsia, but those symptoms are not severe. They may be managed at home. So let's talk about those home management teaching that you're going to do. And then if they have severe symptoms, um, obviously they're going to be managed in the hospital, but let's go over the home. You're going to teach them to clarify with the healthcare provider what's limited and what's restricted. Because depending on that patient's condition, you know, they may be restricted to going to the bathroom. They can get up to go to the bathroom. But that's it. Some patients may be get may be allowed to get up to make themselves a sandwich and just get back into the bed. So you're going to teach them to clarify what their restrictions or what their limitations are. Teach them to have their computer, tablet, smartphone available at the bedside. We want them resting. Have a television DVD player to watch television programs or movies because you're going to get bored very fast in the bed. Delegate responsibilities to family members or friends as much as possible. You need to have somebody responsible for picking up the kids because let me tell you something, even if you're on bed um, um, bed rest with some privileges, one of those privileges is not going to be to get in your car and go pick up your children. Absolutely not. So you're going to have to have somebody responsible for picking up the kids, going to do laundry, going to do grocery shopping, right? Have... Um, things available at the bedside or couch and things available, um, anything that the patient's going to need for them not to get up to go get, if that makes sense. So example, um, notepads, actually there's a list here, uh, post-it notes, straws, paper, paper, uh, cups, spoons, fourth knife, thing to eat because where they're going to, things to eat, where they're going to be eating in the bed. Yeah. Wet wipes, reading material, books, audio magazines. So anything that, you know, the patient knows they're going to need often or they're most likely going to need, have it very close to the bed or on top of the bed. Stock a mini refrigerator or cooler with water or other beverages or healthy sna snacks so mom doesn't have to keep getting up to go to the kitchen and grab something. Hospital precautionary measures for women with preeclampsia. And notice, you guys know when I say no with three exclamation marks, I'm serious, right? Right. So the environment, again, we are going to treat them like we do the patients 
who have seizure disorders, we want to decrease stimulation. So we're going to put them in, in a quiet environment, non-stimulating. We're going to make sure that the lights are soft. We're going to make sure we don't have the TV on, the radio on, patients right next to the nurse's station where, you know, the family's acting the fool, uh, nurses are getting report. No, we want to decrease stimulation. Patient's going to be on seizure precautions. You better make sure you have seizure equipment at the uh, bedside. Seizure, suction, suction equipment at the bedside, oxygen at the bedside in case the patient does go into seizures, okay? Suction equipment tested and it's ready to use at the bedside. Oxygen administration equipment tested and ready to use at the bedside. Make sure the call button's within reach and you um, teach them to use the call button for any reason. You got to get to go to the bathroom, you press that call button. Emergency medications available on the unit. Now, these medications, I'm going in depth with them the last part of the series, which is the next one, part five. What are those? Hydralazine. Um, if you haven't watched my video already on um the antihypertensive medications, go back and watch it. It's very informative. But hydralazine, guys, this is like the end of the line when it comes to hypertension, right? These are the big gun antihypertensive medications. Hydralazine, labetalol, that's a beta blocker. You have your nifedipine, the calcium channel blocker, uh, magnesium sulfate. Now, magnesium, I want you to notice something. You see how I put an arrow and I wrote decreased blood pressure? Let me make this clear to you. Hydralazine, labetalol, nifedipine, those three are given as hypertens antihypertensive medications. You see magnesium sulfate? We give this to prevent seizures. We do not give it as an antihypertensive medication. Now, it has a side effect of bringing down the blood pressure, which is great. We're killing two birds with one stone. But listen to me. I promise you, I've been doing this for a long time. If you get a test question about the indication, which, is, which means the reason we're giving magnesium sulfate, it is not to bring down the blood pressure. It has an effect of bringing down the blood pressure, which is wonderful. We like that. But there are so many... Um, better drugs on the market that will bring down the blood pressure without so many adverse effects. We, we're not going to give magnesium sulfate to bring down the blood pressure. We're going to give it to prevent the patient from going into eclampsia. Okay. These three drugs are the drugs that we're going to give to bring down the blood pressure. But anyway, um, all these four medications are emergency medications that you need to have available on the unit. I forgot about my calcium gluconate or, um, excuse me, calcium gluconate or calcium chloride. You need that antidote for magnesium sulfate because what happens if you give that patient a little bit too much magnesium sulfate? So you want to make sure you have the antidote available at the bedside. Again, guys, I'm going to go in depth on the next part of the series and emergency birth pack easily accessible because that patient can get go into labor at any time. Let's take a look at this care plan. I know as students, you guys love just ignoring those care plans and you just want to read the text, but those care plans, um, they really reinforce a lot of important information that you are supposed to catch from the text, right? Remember I told you when you see certain information being just repeated over and over again, there's a reason the author's repeating the information. You're going to see this test question. These are things you need to know. So let's go over this case study. Look at what it says. Let me make it a little bit larger for you. Olga is a 38-year-old Gravda 3 para 0111 who was diagnosed with preeclampsia at 32 weeks gestation. At the time, she was placed on restricted activity and scheduled for fetal and maternal assessment twice a week at the prenatal clinic. At a scheduled clinic visit at 35 weeks, Olga states in the interview that she has not been eating well because she feels nauseated. She complains of a headache of two days duration and shortness of breath when she's out of bed for any length of time. Physical examination findings are as follows. Blood pressure 170 over 110. Deep tendon reflex is four plus. Two beats clonus. Facial and hand edema. Weight gain of three kilograms, about 6.6 .6 pounds in a week. Bilateral breast sounds are clear to auscultation. Proteinuria three plus dipstick. Fetal heart rate 140s by Doppler ultrasound. Olga was admitted to the labor and birth unit with a diagnosis of preeclampsia with severe features. And we know it's with severe features, guys, because look at what's going on. What are we seeing? We're seeing the proteinuria. We're seeing that, look at that blood pressure, that 110 over 70. We're seeing the deep tendon reflect. Oh, wait a minute. I'm giving you your answers for the care plan. Let's keep going. We'll talk about that in a minute. 
where was I? With severe features, IV magnesium sulfate was initiated per unit protocol and she was placed on continuous electronic fetal heart rate monitoring. Okay, so that's what's going on with our patient, Olga. Assessment. What are the most important signs and symptoms that the nurse should look for in a woman with preeclampsia with severe features? And here's the answer. Here are our defining characteristics. Nausea, upper right quadrant or epigastric pain. Remember, she's been feeling nauseous. That's why she hasn't been um, eating. Blurred vision, headaches, unresponsive to treatment. And then another way of saying this is, um, oh, what's that word? Um, like unrelieved headache. There's another word I'm looking for. But uh, anyway, headaches that the patient has that they take something for, such as acetaminophen, or Motrin, and despite that measure that evidence-based practice has shown us should alleviate the problem, does not alleviate the problem, okay? Hypertension, proteinuria, seizure activity. By the way, they're going to seizure activity. That patient's not in eclampsia, right? Right. Abnormal lab results, such as low platelet count, elevated liver uh, enzymes, elevated serum creatinine level. Nursing diagnosis, obviously, risk for injury. Risk for injury related to CNS irritability, seizures, or and or magnesium sulfate treatment. And the expected outcome, what we want to see happen, Olga will show diminished signs of CNS irritability. How can we see if the CNS irritability is declining? The deep tendon reflexes, because right now she's at four plus. So we want to see it diminish, right? Less or equal to two plus absence of clonus and her having no seizure activity. That's how we know it gets, it's getting better from where she is now. Nursing interventions. You want to establish a baseline um, data, the t d you know, deep tendon reflexes, the clonus. Administer IV magnesium sulfate per physician's order. Why? Look at this. Prevention. Not to decrease blood pressure. I can't tell you how many times nursing students, you guys get this wrong. We give it to prevent that patient from going into seizures because magnesium does what? Causes relaxation. It relaxes the uterus. Relaxes those vessels, okay? We're going to monitor the maternal vital signs level of consciousness, fetal heart rate, urine output. That's a biggie. Deep tendon reflexes, IV flow, and serum levels of magnesium sulfate, because we sure don't want to put that patient into um, mag toxicity. Have calcium gluconate or calcium chloride available on the unit. Why? This is the antidote for magnesium sulfate in case that patient goes into magnesium sulfate toxicity. You're going to maintain a quiet, darkened environment. Again, we want to decrease stimuli. So let's continue with this case study. Olga continues to experience headaches and blurred vision. Her blood pressure remains elevated above 160 over 110, and she's voiding very small amounts infrequently. Assessment. What evidence is there of a decreased blood circulation to the periphery that occurs with vasospasms and leads to decreased tissue perfusion in all organ systems? And let me tell you something. The first organ to shut down when that perfusion is decreased is going to be what? The kidneys. Absolutely. So look, let's look at these defining characteristics. Again, headaches, blurred vision, hypertension, Oliguria, they're not urinating at all or just a little bit. Increased creatinine levels, kidneys in trouble. Increased plasma uric acid levels. Kid, um, kidneys aren't filtering the blood like it's supposed to. Decreased uroplacental perfusion. That placenta is not getting enough of, of the oxygen, vitamins, minerals, nutrients that that blood is supposed to be providing. Nursing diagnosis is going to be ineffective, ineffective peripheral tissue perfusion. Expected outcome, what do we want to see happen? Olga will exhibit signs of adequate, meaning enough, tissue perfusion. How, we can, how can we tell if those organs and tissues are being perfused adequately? We'll see the urine output start to go up. Urine output is supposed to be at least 30 mLs an hour. So we'll start to see urine outputs uh, start to increase, and we'll see normal fetal heart rate tracing. Nursing interventions, we're going to monitor, obviously, the urine output. Patient's going to have an indwelling catheter because we have we need to have strict INOs on this patient. 
We're going to monitor the creatinine and urine acid levels. We're going to monitor the blood pressure. We're going to place Olga on bed rest in a sideline position, preferably which side? Left side. We want to increase perfusion to the fetus. Uh, monitor the fetal heart rate tracing for rate baseline variability and the absence of late decelerations. We don't want late decelerations. Remember, guys, those are bad. Monitor, monitor all goes urine output again via indwelling urinary um, catheter. It's the second time we're seeing this. So um, on video five, the last part of the series, I'll continue with the case study. Okay, there's one more part of the case study. I'll do it on VO5 and we'll go over those medications. And that is it for this video. So guys, the last part, which the last part of the series, which is going to be part five, the next video, I'm going to continue the case study and go over all the medications that are important for you to know for testing purposes when it comes to preeclampsia and eclampsia. Um, guys, thank you so much for watching this video. Please let me know in the comment section what you thought about this video, what you'd like to see more of, what you'd like to see me actually teach, or maybe do a video where I'm covering questions on. Don't forget to have audio lessons available on my website, nexusnursinginstitute.com. Again, thank you for watching this video. and You guys will catch me on the next video.